Hello, and welcome to our Friday webinar. Uh, we are on with Lisa Bono. Welcome, Lisa. Hi, everyone. And today, what are we doing today? We are doing, uh, but I heard it on the internet. Can't wait for this. This is going to be totally fun um, and informative and eye opening and shocking, I'm sure, in many ways, because we got to find out what's the real and what's what's not real, what's the truth and what's questionable on information that you might find online, right? Correct. And there's so much of it that we're doing a two parter. And um, I may not be able to get into detail as much as I would like to. Um, but, you know, there's so much bad internet on the um, uh, bad, bad advice on the internet. And people really need to be aware of what advice they're following. And it, it's sad because, you know, a lot of people that may not have access to an avian vet are coming on for help. And just some of the information that's being given is just, I don't know, you want to reach through the computer screen and try to correct it. And sadly, mm -hmm. you can't. So we're going to touch on some of these things and see what uh, we can come up with. And I look forward to everybody giving me some of the things that they've heard as well. That's right. So next week um, we have our part two, and um, if we'll we'll take some we'll, we'll reserve some time for questions at the end. Hopefully, get to some questions. But um, if we don't, if you have a question um, or something you want to comment on, we'll maybe add it to the next one on next next Friday when we do part two, right? Um, and let's see. So I think let's see. Do we have a lot of territory to cover today? <laughs> oh, well, I left some I left some time for questions because I figured there would be, or some people would want to get some comments in. Um, because it was a two-parter, I didn't want to try to jam everything into one like I usually do. Okay. Okay. Um, All right. Yeah, this would be really interesting. And it's, um, I guess if you look at a timeline, it, what are we talking about? Like, well, since the internet, it's been launched, right? So, yeah. yep. but, uh, but, We're you know, more and more, it, it seems, um, you know, more and more, it's easier for people to, to jump on any kind of platform and just, um, put a, a, a suggestion out there like that might be questionable. So this will be interesting. All right. So if you do have a question, um, of course, use the Q&A button. And um, and I'm going to I'm going to hand it off to you, Lisa, because uh, you have a PowerPoint for us. Yes, so I do. Let me get to it. Hold on one second. Oh, yeah. And while you're doing that, just that I mean, our team, uh, the Fever team is at the uh, Super Zoo, um, the Super Zoo, the, which is the big pet. Um, pet industry event in Vegas. So everyone give a shout out to them. So they've been in there all week, I think. So yes, they've been busy. I've been following them on the internet. Ah, there you go. <laughs> right. So I you want guys, to thank everybody. Oh, go ahead. I'm not sorry. You go ahead. I was gonna say just a reminder. Yeah, you can follow the Fieber on, on their social channel. So uh see what they're up to, what what, what shows they're at and stuff. So there you go. I want to thank everybody for coming today, and uh, I want to say I'm back. I know I've had quite a few people that have written me or called to make sure that I was doing okay, and um, I am, and I actually took a little time off to do what normal people do, and that's a slight vacation. I hadn't been down to see my family in Florida for over four years and my friends, so I decided to go down there. And um, just a picture or two of what I've been up to. Um, here we go. Before I went down to Florida, I went up to North Carolina at the Biltmore. I was able to work with some of the birds of prey up there. So what do normal people do when, or what do bird people do when they go on vacation? They usually surround themselves with more birds. So this was the first time I was able to work with these guys and they were actually, it was a pretty awesome experience. Then I went down to Key West. I actually won a weekend down there. So we drove down there, and I want you to turn your speakers down if you're at work so you don't get in trouble. I'll give you a second to do that. And these, uh, I got to meet actually flamingos. So here we go. Sometimes these need to take a minute to load. So here I am. I'm not sure who that is, but the flamingo loved him. And this is at the Key West Butterfly um, Conservatory. 
So we had walked all day long in 98 degree weather to get down there to meet these guys. And it's been on my bucket list. So I was thrilled to do so. A hint, if you go down there, make sure you wear a hat and try to sit on the end because the flamingos love guys. They love the facial hair. They love the hats. And I was in the middle, so they really didn't come up to me that much. I had really nothing to offer them. So it's an experience. It's a great thing to do. So now we're going to talk about the internet. I just wanted to give you a heads up of what I was up to. So way back when, before the internet, we actually had bird clubs. Um, I founded my bird club in 91, and this was me. I'm not sure what's going on with my hair there. I think it just wasn't spiked up in the 90s. This was Polly. And what we used to do is we used to go to schools and uh, Girl Scout meetings, Boy Scout meetings, county fairs, and teach people about birds. It was a great opportunity to have the bird club. We had speakers come in. We had to bounce ideas off of people. We had to learn from people who actually had more experience than we did. So I had to learn cockatiel genetics before it was a thing you could look up on the internet. And we had a gentleman who was a breeder and um, he, he was he was grumpy, but, you know, he, he was a nice man. And he would I would always have lots of questions for him because I was just so interested in soaking up anything I could possibly do. So I started asking him about cockatiel genetics because I had cockatiels and I had two birds that were showing that they wanted to have some babies. So I needed to really learn all I could. And what would happen is, is he would give me a little lesson, a little private lesson, uh, you know, each each bird club meeting. And then the following bird club meeting, I would have questions and a question and answer period with him again solo. And if he if I answered everything correctly, he was so happy and so pleasant to be around with everybody. But if I didn't do my homework, I didn't study, I didn't get my my answers correct. He was not very happy man during that time, and we'd have to go into our next lesson. So, you know, we were learning from people that had the experience. We would have speakers come in. We would have giant meetings, and it was a great way to know your neighbor, know other people in the community and your state. And we actually had three states that were part of mine, and we all learned from each other. And then it's very difficult now because... There's not many bird clubs out there. There are a few that are still longstanding that I used to go to, um, but there's nowhere near as many as there used to be. And it's a shame because you really need that hands-on knowledge versus everything on the internet. So this is a timeline of the internet. And you can see here, 91 is when I started my bird club. I was in my early 20s. And 98 is when I had to actually move and leave the bird club, but it, it continued up until about 14 or 15. And that made me happy knowing there was people still learning from people that came before them just before, you know, just instead of just going on the internet. Now I realize that's an option or the only option for some people is to go on the internet, but we have to learn how to pick out the good information from the bad. And I can tell you that even me being on the internet in 2004, that's when people started bullying me. So no one can escape it if you have a group of people that are set on it. So, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about internet bullying as well. So this is one of my favorite little mems I've seen. Um, and actually, um, my friend Liz Wilson used to send this around a lot um, just to let people know that not to believe everything on the Internet just because there's a picture with a quote next to it. So a lot of people, um, it's either the highway or my way or the highway. The fact of the matter is there's too many social media bird experts out there in misinforming others. Now, how do, how do we know what advice is sound? How do we weed through the internet advice? We need to figure out the good from the bad. It's hard because these experts can be intimidating and sound very sure of the advice that they're giving. And again, it's my way or the highway. Owners need to use their own judgment and trust their instincts about the birds. 
owners need to also have a vet they work closely with. I can't stress enough that's going to be one of the best relationships you have when you have a bird is with your vet. So when people come to the internet looking for advice, there are some people out there that may have good in intentions. There may be sharing, they may be sharing, um, you know, something that worked for them or, you know, somebody told them and it retained the information to share it. Others just believe themselves to be an expert after having a bird for a few weeks, making a website, having a few followers. I tend to run into the second group down there quite a bit on the internet because people are always telling me what I should be doing. And I usually just tell them, thank you and go from there. There are always gonna be people who think they know it all. Reality is no one knows it all. The internet experts hate to hear this and they also hate to be corrected or they hate to have another opinion or view. So, some of the information that's out there is just going to make you shake your head. Other times it isn't easy to find out the good from the bad. And I've actually been attacked and thrown off boards online as well for my opinions or my thoughts because they didn't match up with what everybody else was saying. I've had people try to actually take credit for my knowledge that I've learned through the years and said that they, I've learned everything from them. And I guess that they didn't realize all the classwork and casework and everything else that I've put into my career to try to help other people. Even with all the years that I've been in agriculture and all the different experiences that I have, it's a compliment when people call me an expert, but I don't see myself as an expert. I see myself as a work in progress. I'm continuously learning, evolving, changing, and sharing. And we should all want to try to do that. Something that worked back in 2004 or 2002 or 1990 it's probably updated from here. So if you're still giving that information from them, you could be doing harm to the next person that truly needs it. While the principles of medicine and behavior will mostly stay the same, we find new ways, often better ways, to deal with problems and issues. People who think they know it all never want to grow. And usually the ones that are rather boisterous, are usually the ones that you really have to think about what they're saying. And you always want to get a second opinion. So let's ask ourselves when trying to decipher online advice. Now, first off, this is from Phoenix Landing Retreat in 2016. And I was trying my best because I know where I usually sit. And I was looking around, and if you can see my mouse all the way over here, to the right, I was thinking, why is there an owl there? So I got sidetracked trying to figure out what that was. It's actually somebody has a ponytail and my eyes were playing tricks on me. So I don't want anybody else to think that. Um, it's just a ponytail and the way the picture was taken. Couldn't find myself, doesn't mean I wasn't in this lecture. Could, I could have been in one of the other ones. So let's again, let's ask ourselves when trying to decipher online advice. Is the advice being given coming from a reliable source or is it just somebody on the internet that you don't know, or like I said, maybe has a bird for two weeks? Is the information given based on research and information being used by a reliable source? What I mean by that is have they quoted studies based on science coming from the veterinary sites or veterinarians themselves? Are they using educational resource sources such as articles or webinars written or presented by well-known experts and veterinary professionals? Are, are they attending continuing education seminars or conferences? Again, I can't stress this enough. Um, Lefebvre's was just away. I'm not sure if it was Exotics Con, but they were just away at a big educational conference. And we should all try to, if we're able to attend, whether it's online or in person, because the, what you're going to learn is invaluable. First one we're going to hit, 
you're going to see my um, the, the quotes I've seen online or the comments I've seen online are going to be read in towards the top. So we're talking about nutritional needs. I've heard so many times that people do nothing but feed fresh diet, meaning chop. I call it mash. Sure. We'll refer to it as that. Chop is all you need. That's what everybody says. And many people have disregarded veterinary advice and fed a fresh only diet due to internet advice. This has led to many nutritional issues with the birds not getting the correct formulated diet. This happens because of homemade diets and people applying human nutrition to birds and flat out ignoring scientific studies on captive flocks. Chop is a great addition to a diet, but it is not a complete diet. I hear formulated diets are bad. <clears throat> they have ingredients you can't pronounce. And if it requires data safety sheet, it's toxic. Well, let's see, what's a formulated diet? All formulated diet means is that it's a nutritionally and balanced diet. Some of the companies that produce these formulated diets have been studying captive birds and their needs for over two generations. It doesn't sound like much, but it is compared to this boom of bird keeping and what we've learned over the past couple generations. They're not obviously as well versed as dogs and cats because they've been here thousands of years. In my lifetime, I'm not going to be able to say that with birds, but hopefully down the road we'll know as much. But we have to stick with what we know and these people that are doing these studies and learning about it. Some formulated diets have been collaborated with board certified avian vets, and the main goal is to keep your bird healthy. People say, oh, well, the pellets are so expensive and, you know, they're just trying to get money. No, they are not. Their goal is to keep your bird healthy. If you're feeding a good diet, then there's less chance you're going to have an issue that's going to end up costing you more when you go to the vet. So you want to be preventative and make sure they're getting a good diet. People ask which is going to be the best pellet for your bird. And I usually say whatever one you're able to get them to eat. Formula di formulated diet is going to be better than taking a guess at what your bird needs to stay healthy. I am also not 100% against seed. And before people start throwing their hands up in the air and getting all upset, um, there are some nutritional values to seed. You can use them as a treat. Um, I'm not going to be the first one to turn around and say it's going to kill you because you'll hear that all the time on the internet that seeds are going to kill your birds. Um, you, how, did, how did we get here in bird keeping? People have been keeping birds for generations and these formulated diets have only been out, I could be wrong, but I believe from the early 90s, they started coming out. So what did the people in the 60s, 70s, and 80s do before they came out? So granted, our birds are living longer now because of the formulated diet, and that's what we want to strive to use. But I'm not going to tell you that a seed is going to kill your bird because you hear it all the time on the internet. For more information, there's a link on the bottom that you can follow and read it all for yourself. Um, I really couldn't uh, decipher a lot of the charts that were on there. So it was just better off if you go and look yourself and then figure out if you would actually be able to figure out what your bird needs on a daily basis. Hold on. Um, as far, we're going back one, as far as the formulated diets, um, they have ingredients that you can't pronounce. This is what some people will say. Again, the red quotes. Um, some may question what form of, or source of vitamin is used. Well, all of those are really hard to pronounce. It doesn't mean it's something bad. It means that the company that is telling you what's in it is being transparent about the product. As far as a data safety sheet, it's toxic. That is incorrect. It requires special handing, handling or safety gloves. It's toxic. Toxic. Not entirely wrong, but misinterpreted. 
Most vitamins in their pure form are highly toxic because you can absorb too much and get an overdose. So special handling is needed while adding these ingredients. Too much of a good thing can be toxic. We just had a woman on the news here a few weeks ago, well, since I've been home, that actually died from ingesting too much water on a hot day. So too much of a good thing can be just as dangerous. So you have to be careful. And again, the company is just being transparent. Do you know what your bird is eating? Well, you should. If you're using a package, you know, a um, package diet, from say like a store, you wanna make sure the ingredients that you know are going in there, what they are. This is gonna help you, it's gonna help your vet. If you have a factory sealed bag, read the bag, read the entire bag, see what's in there. If you have questions, talk about it with your vet or you can contact the company, they're there to help. If you hear someone bad mouthing a certain diet, you, have to look and think, why is this being said? We've all seen it on the internet. Look for an ulterior motive and consider the source. Is it somebody that maybe wasn't happy with the diet or maybe, you know, they bought it somewhere and, you know, it's been sitting in this store or warehouse or wherever for too long and they get it and there's something wrong with it. And then they, instead of reaching out to the company, they start bad mouthing a certain diet or is another person who has a competing product, are they bad mouthing a diet? Um, if you read about a product being bad, Who's the information coming from? Is it someone trying to sell you something different? Is somebody trying to get your business or a reputable company, a reputable company promotes their own product without bad mouthing their competitors? Keep in mind, if an individual is trashing one company, but everybody else you know and respect says the opposite, maybe that one person has a dispute with the company. This is another one I've seen a lot lately. And this is probably something else you wanna to talk to your vet about, withholding food. And I'm not sure why this has become such a popular idea. I mean, I just saw it again on the internet today. You don't withhold food to switch diets. You start to add different things into the diet and lessen the amount of the stuff you want to get off of. You don't just withhold food so the bird will get hungry enough and it will eat. That's not the way it works, and you're going to have a very sick. Another trend I've been seeing is don't you withhold food or limit food. And I'm not sure where that's coming in because in all my 40-plus uh, years of having birds, I've never really had an obese bird that I had to withhold food from or limit food or measure foods. Now, if maybe if you have a bird that's gonna be a perch potato, um, that's a different thing and that's coming from your vet. It's not coming from somebody online and saying, you gotta limit the food. Uh, you're only supposed to give three pellets a day. That's it, that, that is not healthy. And you always have to look at the, the information you're getting. And even if you're experienced, and I try to do this all the time, even if you're experienced and you're reading or you're seeing something online, you have to think about it as if you were a first time bird owner seeing this information. And we'll get into that a little bit more with some of the things that I have in the webinar, but that's how I always try to approach things. Um, you know, people will get angry on my page because I don't allow certain pictures because, you know, while that might work for somebody, you have a new owner that just bought a bird and now they're gonna take the bird out with no harness, no clip, no nothing. And then we see them on 911 parrot alert. So there, there's, you, you do have to be careful. Um, there's just so much bad information out there. Uh, the only time you would um, wanna limit is again, after you talk to your vet, because you might be directed to do so if your bird is having surgery or is overweight, but not just because someone on the net directed you to do so. 
I know some trainers will use this in theory to teach. And unless you're working with them, this is not something for an average parrot owner to just start doing because they saw it on the net. Now we have viral videos, perpetuating bad advice. Putting your bird in a dangerous situation is not cute. It's never cute. Um, and I'll, I'll say that it, it verges on stupid. Um, mixing birds of different sizes, house, different household pets can end up with deadly consequences. We hear about it all the time. Your bird is not best friends with your dog or cat. You can't train a predatory drift out of a dog and cat. You may have more docile animals. Some breeds are more docile, more calm, and more tolerable, but they are still predators, and predatory drift can happen at any time. It's usually the little dogs that you have to watch out that will switch really quick, and they're usually the ones with the um, worst outcome. But again, you want to be very careful. So we have these people on the net that really think these things are cute. And again, first time bird owner is going to see this and say, oh, I can put my bird with, with my cat and it'll be fine. So despite the giggling, this isn't cute. Right there. The cat was annoyed. Didn't look like it was going to hurt the bird. But if he scratched him, then you're going to have to be treated, okay? So the, that bird was extremely lucky that the cat dealt with it as long as it did. And hopefully the owner will have learned something. First time owner is not a good idea. So I have to say this owner did an excellent job with reading body language here. First time owner probably wouldn't know what they're looking for. An Amazon owner may not know what they're looking for, um, but misinterpreting body, body language representing hormonal chasing or attack behavior as being funny is not. A lot of people have issues with their birds chasing their feet on the floor or chasing people in the house or chasing other pets. Um, they'll put up pictures or videos and how cute it is. And then you'll hear that somebody stepped on the bird and needed surgery or you, you have to be careful. And stuff like this is, is not funny. Again, this owner did excellent job of reading body language. <laughs> Hopefully you can hear it. If you cannot let me know. Oh, can't can't hear it. Um, we actually played this one, I think, I, I, and when it began in one of the webinars. Um, is this where you say I'm not going to hurt you? Oh, okay, so what's what's Thank happening you. here? Um, the bird is trying to lure her in with some really super sweet talk and saying, "I'm not going to hurt you, come here, darling." And she's doing an excellent job. And I'm going to speed it up. Oh, I think I'm okay. Kind of hear it. Let's see. Oh, you can hear it now. I thought I could, but. Uh... No, shoot. Okay, so all along she was telling the bird, no, I'm not gonna pick you up. And she read that that bird was gonna fly at her. Now, she knew what she was doing. Somebody who just got an Amazon or does, doesn't know Amazon, they're gonna think, oh, the bird's being cute. And you know, this is gonna cause behavioral issues. It's gonna cause trust issues. So you have to be careful of what you're watching. This is, it's, it's cute the way she knows what she's doing, but for the for the regular person, this is not educational for a first time bird owner um, to try to prove a point. So um, I don't think there's any I don't think there's any uh, talking in this video, and I'll hit it twice to see if we can get it to play. But these are, some of these are really super cute, but other ones you'll be able to pick off right away, being a bird owner. What shouldn't be out there for these first time owners? Again, internet advice, this is for clicks. And again, it's, some of them are super cute, some of them are dangerous, so here we go. Oh. 
Wow. Barking like a dog. Oh, that's cute. What is he doing? <laughs> yes. Ooh. He's barking. More barking. So some, like I said, some of them are cute. <laughs> My guys would be doing this if they were given a chance. Yeah. Is he doing peekaboo? <laughs> yes, he's doing peekaboo. And what do you think first time owners are thinking? Oh, my bird can get along with my cat. And this one's crying. I'm sure he got the police called on him a couple times with that perfect baby <laughs> crying. Oh, wow. They're just screaming back and forth. Is he emptying the dishwasher? What is he doing there? Oh, a drawer, but I can't see. Yeah. So again, some of these are really cute. There was no way for me to decipher the good ones from the bad ones. Oh yeah. To take them out. So, yeah. but again, this is this is what's out on the internet. And we have to watch it as a first time owner. Oh, I need my budget to do that. <laughs> <laughs> of course, these guys are super smart. They wanted a triangle. Wow. So it's cute until there's a problem. So that's pretty much it for that. So keep in mind what you're posting and what you're following and what you're sharing because you are, um, you're advocating for it either way, what you're doing. And you want to make sure that you are keeping everybody's Bird safe. So here's one clipping versus not clipping. Yep, we're going here. <laughs> so my bird can't fly. Um, this is completely incorrect unless your bird has been diagnosed by a vet, has had like a broken leg or deformity or, you know, wing, something like that. Um, most people have absolutely normal birds, but never physically seen the bird fly. So they think their bird never will. Okay. So these are three of my guys here. First one was Otis. Sadly, you can see his wings are clipped. Okay. He was with me in the early nineties. That's what we were told to do. And in the middle, you have Sterling. Stupid me. He's in the gazebo, but he is out. I never thought he could fly. You guys have seen videos of him flying. I could have lost him very easily. And then you have Sydney uh, on the right. And you can see there, Sydney is clipped as well. Um, again, it's what we were thought we were supposed to do. So um, Sydney's wings were clipped. I took him outside to show him that nice new fence that you see behind Sterling with the little pond there. I figured I'd take him out. We just had the fence put up. It was just something to do. Well, we walked outside and Sydney was completely clipped and he's overclipped compared to most grays because he is a buff little boy. So as soon as we walked out, he screamed and he flew. And let me tell you, a clipped bird will fly 
if it gets um, spooked enough, the adrenaline is there. If the wind is there to help, if you have low lying trees, there's a whole bunch of things that can come into play. And Sydney took off and the only thing that stopped him uh, because he was flying a lot louder than I could scream and run after him. He hit that fence head on and fell to the ground. Now, of course, I thought he died. I picked him up and I'm crying and I'm carrying him back with both hands to, um, you know, the spot, the door, you know, where we came out of and couldn't figure out how to open the door because I didn't want to let him go with my two hands. He was, he was fine. He was dazed, but he was fine. I'm standing there trying to figure out how to open the door without letting go of him with my, my hands. And all of a sudden a feather fell on me. And I'm thinking, where did that come from? And about 10 feet in the air up over our head, there was a hawk eating a pigeon. So the bird that never flew before took off. And thankfully, um, because our property was higher than the property in the back, if that fence didn't stop him, he would have been in a neighbor's treetops. And then it, I would be lucky if I got him back. Um, since then, my guys all have learned how to fly, and we've we've talked about that. Um, I've taken precautions, but I see it all the time. People will share pictures of the birds outside, unrestrained, just sitting on their shoulder, sitting on the ground, and then the next thing. Um, we hear about them being, you know, on 911 power alert or a lost bird. So don't ever listen to somebody on the net that's going to say, my bird can't fly unless there's been a diagnosis from the vet because it will fly. And it doesn't matter. Sterling was in his late 30s when I first saw him fly. This was a quote somebody sent me because they wanted me to talk about this a little bit. So I constantly read know-it-alls commenting about wing clip birds not being able to fly. But in fact, I've seen and own, so have I, clip birds fly. Not very high or great distances, but enough. This is the worst advice someone could give a bird owner in her opinion. And I agree. I made a mistake myself. Luckily, my situation turned out okay. But I'm going to make sure that on my page... Um, my group page, no one is going to post outside unrestrained. And if they don't want to hear my story, that's too bad. But I'm not going to let the first time bird owner see that advice and think they could do it. So you think your birds, you know, your birds clipped and they can't fly. Well, sadly, here's one. He's been missing for over a year. So um, we hope to hear him back someday. And it's very sad. But a clipped bird can fly. See down here, I said he was clipped. Now, oh, I clipped my own bird's wings. And then people go so, online. I'm not sure about that. Uh, Alexa <laughs> just answered me. That's funny. <laughs> um, so here's a video that I wanted to share. And people go online and this is the advice they're given. Oh, shoot. There's no sound at, at a, oh, wow. There's no, they, they're not saying anything. It's just music. Is that a dog or a cat below the bird too? Oh, it's a there's, dog. There's a little dog. Yeah. But look how they're clipping that wing. Wow. Oh. Okay. So people go online and this is the advice they get about how, how to clip wings. That's horrible. First off, um, that bird is going to be um, very, very stunted with any kind of flight or landing. And then you also saw the little dog in the background. That's why I've been playing the clips so people can figure out what's going on in the background. You also saw a little dog. Now with this little bird, they can't get away. Oh, so um, these are some things, improper wing clipping, if you're, if somebody tells you, oh yeah, you can clip, just do it like this. Well, I want to keep, I want you to keep this in mind. And I kept the, the cockatiel in the corner. I kept it small, not to upset anybody. Um, if a bird lands wrong, they can, um, break their, uh, the skin on their chest. Okay. So then they have to have surgery to close that wound. And then what happens is the bird really has to be kept calm and not move around a lot because the bird, if it flaps its wings again, that can split wide open. So usually 
they usually end up having a few surgeries to correct that. And that could be from inappropriate wing trims. Now, um, also, if you look down in the right-hand corner with the wing that's out, also um, what happens is a lot of times the birds will sit there and they'll pick on their feathers and the, the feathers that are left in the shafts and they become like little sharp needles and they end up poking into the skin. So a lot of times birds will start picking underneath the wings because it is, it's bothering them and it hurts them. And then of course, then you see my Sydney in the middle, um, his wings were not clipped at that point. I'm not really sure what he did, but he fell and hit my hardwood floor and you could see a piece of his beak sitting there. So if a bird can't land properly, you're going to have an issue. Now, looking through the internet, I did find this. I don't know who this vet is, but it was on WikiHow, and I like the picture because it was saying, if you don't know what you're doing, make sure you go to your vet. If this is your option and this is what you decide to do, no one has the right in your home to tell you what's right or wrong when it comes to clipping. You have to weigh all the issues you may have in the house with dogs and cats and kids and open doors and open windows and um, versus being alone, knowing that the toilet seat's down, no one's opening the windows. Um, there's no other things in, you know, a healthy bird. The birds were actually made to fly. And this is from Dr. Oros from 2014. And it talks a little bit about Dr. Eccles' research, and he's done, since then, he's done the Great Parrot Anatomy Project, and we've learned a lot more. Um, but, you know, if a bird is not able to fly, they're more prone to obesity as well as liver, kidney, and heart disease. You know, you, you want to make sure that they are the healthiest they can be so they stay with you. So, again, this is, um, this is just a drawing that was... Um, by Dr. Elliot on her page and just saying, you know, you have to be careful and watch if you do decide to let them grow out that you are able to control the entire environment. Proper restraint outdoors is very important whether they are clipped or not. Again, I see so many photos, so many beautiful photos of people having their birds outside. Um, I want to see them either having a harness on in a cage or in a carrier because there are products that are out there that really are not meant for um, parrots. Mm -hmm. They're made for birds of prey. So a lot of times overseas and we have to teach them um, better ways because that's what they're used to in the country. That's what they're told. So a lot of them over there will have leg rings and they'll be chained to things so they don't fly. And people don't know any better because that's the way they're taught. So they come online to find out and we need to explain things that are better ways of doing things to try to help them to understand. Um, a lot of them will use the, the leg restraints. I've seen a lot of leg restraints here. They are too tough for a parrot's leg. Um, they are meant for a very strong leg for a raptor who's used to lifting, you know, prey. Um, parrots don't do that and you, you can cause a lot of problems if you do it. So again, Make sure the products you're using are designed for the species. This is the way they should be outside. Those are obviously, they're all my guys and I get some looks walking up and down the road with all my carriers and strollers. This is the only type of bird that can be outside by itself without, a res without restraints. This is Emma too. She's a stuffed um, little gray that my husband took to Iraq and she traveled all over the world with him. Another thing we hear is birds don't need toys. Um, this is really sad because they have me. Um, a lot of people don't spend money on, say, your canaries and your finches um, as far as toys. But I can tell you that they do like toys or certain toys they like to play with, interact with, and people would never even think that. 
we've seen macaws that barely had anything in their cage. And they say, oh, my bird doesn't like toys or it doesn't need toys. It's got me. Well, that's that's not stimulating the bird at all. I mean, that's just the bird living. It's like you living in a closet with nothing to do. So you got to make sure that when you see information like this, you have to take it from where it's coming and try to educate. So maybe the bird will lead, lead a little bit better life. Then you hear my bird doesn't like toys. And I've heard this so much um, through my career, but I can tell you I, I have helped thousands of bird owners uh, through my store find toys, their birds, like so by saying a bird doesn't like toys and spreading that information or telling people you don't have to buy toys because birds don't like toys it's it's false so you know could be that the people are buying the wrong toys so if somebody again if they're saying something like this don't you know take it from where it's coming from um make sure your birds have toys so I'm going to leave a little time. I'm not even sure how much time we have left, but next time, next week, we're going to um, cover some more things that are going to make you shake your head. We're going to dive into internet bullying, um, including, you know, the start of mine, bad internet, medical advice, um, what makes the vets shake their heads, dangers in your home. People are still doing dangerous things in their home because they're getting information online. And, oh, no, it's safe. Go ahead. Just watch it. Owner shaming, like I spoke about, um, trying to make somebody feel bad because they don't have the knowledge or they don't have the resources to do what they need, they should be doing. And another one um, is going to be shop, but I mean, don't shop, adopt. We're going to talk a little bit about that because um, that can be a little bit misleading and both will have its benefits. So if you have topics you would like me to address, my email is there. Send them to me. You know where to find me on Facebook. And I look forward to it next week. I wow. think that's, we'll leave well, it at this. And I'm going to stop share. Okay. Wow. Yeah, that was uh, eye opening. Um, especially a lot of those videos, because uh, especially um, it's just so popular to watch reels of, of, of animals. And then you just, you see all these situations with birds in it. You right. Know, and, and uh, yeah, if you're not uh, familiar with how birds are, you, you think that's perfectly fine and acceptable with cats and dogs. And that one right. caught you hanging out the window of the car on the drive. Oh, that's Or the bird on a motorcycle. I mean, we have a motorcycle. How dangerous is that? Not only for the bird, but you have to watch everybody else on the road. Yeah. And you're watching the road. You're controlling a vehicle. You don't have control over everybody else on the road and then you have this creature crawling around in between your legs and but people think it's cute so we could do that yeah yeah and that you know cockatoos they do have big beaks and if you're driving with a cockatoo on your shoulder and so you just uh, man that's just a i'd be afraid to be driving around that car so Right. And so that's why I figured by, sh by sharing all those, people can look at it, decide whether they think it, it was cute or whether they would change things or if it's something that, you know, that particular segment they wouldn't share or advise. Um, it makes us all better owners. Yeah. Or maybe even, like, you know, if you are, I may, I maybe comment on it in the videos. They have comment. Like, hey, this might not be very safe for birds. Um all right, we do have some questions for you. Uh, let's see, we got one from uh, Janine uh, asks, true or false, do, uh, does uh, cayenne pepper work for pain relief in birds? They read that it does over and over again online. So that's an advice that's been online a while. Is that true or false? Or I have heard it and seen it online several times myself. I believe I've heard one veterinarian that was holistic say it as well. I have not used it myself. Um, I think what I would probably do is next time you have a cut, put it on there, see if it burns, um, take it from there. If there are some pelleted foods out there that have cayenne pepper in it, so it's not going to hurt the bird from being ingested. My thought is 
how bad is it going to burn being put on there? Now, the septic powder, I'm even saying that, right? Um, that is caustic if it's ingested. So, you know, people will use that. Not only does it burn, it can do damage if the bird's able to chew on it and ingest it. So that's why you do have to be careful. Okay. Okay. Um, and then uh, Isabel asks, uh, how do you approach people who have their dogs and cats around their birds? So there's a delicate way of saying, <laughs> I mean. Well, okay. I, I deal with this a lot as a consultant and I try to explain to people, and it's the truth. You may have the sweetest dog or cat. Doesn't mean they're bad animals. I'm not saying your cat's horrible, get rid of it. I'm just saying your cat has instincts and it has for thousands of years and it's not gonna change. So you, while you can be vigilant and watch as much as you can, it's only a recipe for disaster. Um, you know, cat has bacteria in its, in its mouth and on its claws, and even a simple scratch can, can kill your bird in 24 hours if it's not medically taken care of. So why take that chance? I see a lot of videos, um, and a lot of people, again, on my page, try to post dog and, and bird pictures together. And there are some good train, dog trainers. I'm not a dog trainer. There are some good dog trainers out there that might have some better advice with certain species. But I'm looking at it, again, as a first-time owner, seeing this. I don't allow it on my site because I don't want somebody to come back to me tomorrow and say my dog killed my bird. Mm, yeah. And I think a point to, is also that uh, a, a cat is, uh, they're, they're able to kind of hop up. I mean, they can reach bird cage, birds in cages. So keep that in mind if you have a household with a cat or uh, they, you'd have to really be diligent and, and probably have the, the cage in an area that, that can't be accessible to the cat. Correct. And I'll tell people if they have, um, say, a small dog and they have a bigger bird and they're concerned with the bird biting the dog or the dog degloving the bird's leg, um, you can also get plexiglass and attach it to the cage. Now, you don't want to go up all the way. You just want to get that little vital area where the animals are going to be able to interact, mm. um, especially if you're traveling in a, in a vehicle. And they're going to be sitting on the seat together and you're not watching. You want to make sure you have a divider in there that neither one can get around um, to prevent issues. Okay. Uh, and then Rhonda pointed out, uh, let's see, regarding shorter days and artificial light, since days are now getting shorter, uh, what is the amount of artificial light our birds should get? Is it, and also is it... Uh, UVA, UVB, UVA slash UVB combined. There's a lot of information that contradicts each other. So what, what's the deal on lighting here? <laughs> well, I had a particular light I used for many years and um, I only left it on a timer for five hours a day. And that was usually when the days were getting long, uh, shorter, I was at work. Um, I would have it come on say around maybe 1.30 ish. And then it would stay on till 6.30 ish and I was home by six to turn the regular lights on. Um, for the best lighting information, uh, I, I know Rhonda, I can send her the information. Um, Dr. Laura Wade did some research uh, on different types of lighting and what's the best and you know what you wanna look for. Um, and I can send her that link. And it's been in past webinars as well. Okay, okay. Um, and then, uh, Beverly, um, says, uh, they're not, they were not aware that a clip bird can't fly many years ago. Um, so happy to have found, uh, you on your Facebook. Uh, so they learned so much, including about candles and Teflon, uh, too many people are in it say that some types of candles are safe. So what's the, what's your take on that? Are, are there candles that are safe or is it just something that if you have birds, you might just want to avoid? Um, we will get into that next week, okay. but hold on. I'll show you the only candle. Excuse me one second. See, I got my old bird club oh. shirt on. Wow, it looks brand new. <laughs> yeah. Good care of it. <laughs> okay. So this is the only candle that I say is safe. Okay. 
It's got the little fake wick there. Oh, that's it's going to be mystique or luminara. So when you turn it on, it dances around and it looks real. There's no scent. There's no nothing. It's batteries. Oh, there you go. All right. So that's what I suggest. And we're going to get into all that household, you know, stuff that they say is safe and um, that we need to discuss. And that's that's uh, for next week. Okay. Okay. Um... Oh, and then uh, Beverly points out that some people say they want to pair it, like especially a, an African gray, so they can teach it to swear, um, which, you know, which some people, I guess that's their thing. And other people probably not realize that that bird might be less adoptable. Is that what the, if it's had to be rehomed? And that's exactly what it is. It's going to be harder to place. In reality, we all want to get that warm, fuzzy feeling saying my birds are going to be with me forever. Mm -hmm. That is not reality. Um, and then what ends up happening is when you need to adopt them out, you can't find a home because a lot of a lot of homes are going to have little kids and no one wants a bird dropping the F bomb or anything like that. So it's it's uh, it's very difficult. And I did want to bring up something real quick. If you guys can see behind me, this is Sterling here. I've seen a lot of birds recently on the internet, this he's uh, he's 41. You see how he was laying down, now he just stood up. He's actually um, going to the vet in a couple of weeks. We got, got an appointment to check that out. So um, if anybody's wondering why he's laying down, say, versus Emma up there being all proud queen, that's what's going on. Oh, wow, okay, all right. Um... And then, uh, oh, Bonnie wants how, how to stop this. The uh, scary things that, that are that are done, uh, including Facebook admins who can turn off comments when something um, inaccurate is given. So how do you dispel this bad information that, that might be out there? Um, I do have my admin, I do have a great team on my page um, who keep an eye out for different things. If there's something that's in question, uh, they'll usually call me in or I'll call somebody else call, call somebody else and it has more experience. Like if it's a medical one, I have a girlfriend that is very good with all that stuff where I might know not know the exact words, but she does. If you're on a page that is continuously shutting off all the comments, um, is not open to new ideas and new information that's coming out that might not be the page for you i mean mm. i have people come on my page and they want to share pictures of dogs and cats they're not my page is not the spot for them so you know if you have somebody that's me or the highway um yeah you have to think about that yeah yeah that kind of brings me to a story i covered uh, a few years ago about when the the video game minecraft was that it's a really popular very popular game amongst kids, especially. Um, they introduced a parrot character in the game, and to like the bonus or whatever the 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 goal was, but it was to feed the parrot. It was like cookies, like chocolate chip. I can't remember. It was like chocolate chip cookies, and um, they got so many uh, a, a little campaign together of of people saying that that's not what you would feed a parrot. <laughs> that they actually changed the item in the game to be healthier. Oh. Yeah, so like it did make a difference that people wrote in and said like this is not what you would. Like to, you know, cause you, you got young people playing that game and they're growing up thinking that it's okay to feed uh, chocolate chip cookies to animals. <laughs> so. Exactly. Exactly. And that's uh, something we're going to talk about as well um, next week, as far as different items and people saying there's, they're, they're good, but in reality, the company's saying, no, they're not that good. Don't use them. You know, so we're going to cover that as well. So um, well, I look forward to next 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 Friday or a new part two of this, right? So if we didn't get to your question today, then then uh, we'll try to address it next next Friday, same time, same place, but next week. Um, I got announced today's winner, um, which uh, of course, since we're giving away these exclusive, let's see, there we go, uh, the banana nutriberries uh, for limited limited time only um, in this wonderful gold box, and that's going to go out to. Bonnie Rosenthal. Congratulations, Bonnie. Hope that makes you and your birds weekend. <laughs> Some and and Sydney, Sydney loves the banana ones. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. 
That's really good. Oh, and er I just want to say earlier, uh, we were talking about when when the pelleted diets, for like the formulated diets first came out. Actually, the fever were on the 50th anniversary. So like they actually created the like, first pelleted diet 50 years ago. That was the daily diet. Isn't that great? Okay. Like, yeah. Well, see, I, I wouldn't know that because I was five. So, yeah. and I, I didn't get my first bird till eight. So um, I just remember uh, way back when what was offered in my particular area. So it's good to yeah. know that they've been around and studying it for the, all those generations. Yeah. I mean, it's taken a while for people to realize, hey, pelleted diets are, you know, like really good for your birth, like that, you know, so we've made progress through years. So I'm sure when it first came out, people, it's, you know, uh, dispelling all those myths of what birds should be eating. Um, all right. So let's see. Um, Oh, and everyone's saying that's glad to, glad to see you back, Lisa. So <laughs> we all miss you. you. We're glad you got some um, R and R and some rest and, and vacation time, and um, that's good. So uh, yeah, so now we get you back twice. So next Friday, tune in. <laughs> uh, we're gonna do part two of this series, and uh, if you think of anything, um, uh, you know, that's uh, we're we'll probably have a lot of people uh, on the internet this week <laughs> trying to trying to find things. Um, yeah, let's see what the, if, I'm just curious if someone finds something super outrageous um, online that we could look at, but. Uh, I, I have been scouring pages and it's just like, I have so many things written down. It's like, how do I, how do I get it in there? You know, how, it's, it's, it's frustrating, you know, some of the advice that's out there. Yeah, yeah, all right. Um, well, on that note, let's see. So we'll look forward to seeing you next Friday um, and everyone have a great weekend. All the best to you and your birds, and everyone stay safe and uh, uh, just watch the information that you're you're reading online and make sure it's good. Sound advice. All right. On that note, uh, everyone have a great weekend. All the best to you and your birds. Bye. Till next time. Till next Friday. Bye. Bye. Bye.